I am going to try to change the way you think about your journeys for the rest of your life. And I'm going to do that by looking at how we find our way. And then I have a strange question for you. When I was 10, my mother took my sister and me on a summer holiday to the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. And without my knowing it, she booked me onto a five-day dinghy sailing course. And I really didn't want to go on this course. I was a painfully shy 10-year-old. And I kicked off about it in the way that only a 10-year-old knows how to. But my mother, using tactics that only mums know, persuaded me to give it a go. And I loved it. On the fifth and final day of that course, the instructor approached my sailing partner and me and asked us a question. Where would you like to go today? Now that might sound like a simple, perhaps even harmless question, but trust me, it is an explosive question to ask a 10-year-old because there is a subtext, and it is this. I'm not asking you where your parents want you to go. I'm not asking you where your teachers want you to go. I'm asking you where you want to go today. I suddenly realized in a few enjoyable days, I have been given the tools to pick my own destination and shape a journey towards it. The seed had been sown. Although the word navigation didn't mean anything to me at that age, it had begun to change my life. Actually, it has changed all of your lives too. You might not believe that yet, and that's the odd thing about navigation. It is, and I'll confess a slight bias here, the most beautiful, subtle, and underrated art in the world. What do I mean by underrated? Well, we are all, each and every one of us, navigators. It forms an important and rich part of every day of our lives, and yet we give it little thought and no credit at all. We can tell that something is a fundamental part of the human experience when we find it thread through all the great stories. If we go back to ancient times, we find Odysseus navigating across the sea using a northern constellation, Arctos the Bear, to help him find his way. And more recently, Hansel and Gretel have taught children and adults that getting lost is not a good idea. The moral of that story, you might recall, is that if you get lost, you will be captured and fattened up by a cannibalistic witch and then eaten. <laughs> Getting lost is bad. Think, think of your own favorite story, and I guarantee that navigation forms part of it because it starts the moment we get out of bed. And if you don't believe that, consider this. Have you ever been on a nighttime mission from your bed to the bathroom <laughs> and stumbled, perhaps tripped or stubbed your toe? Like all the great arts, Navigation takes practice, and it doesn't always go perfectly. My love of this wonderful art took me to some extraordinary places. And by my 20s, I was heading to some of the remotest areas on planet Earth. They grew in scale. And 14 years ago, I persuaded a friend to help me on my bid to try and get from England to the highest point in North Africa without buying a ticket. I wanted us to shape our own journey. And so we sailed from Southampton to Jersey in the Channel Islands, and then flew in a tiny plane along the coasts of France and Spain, past the Pillars of Hercules to Tangier in Morocco, then jumped into a 4 by 4 headed up into the High Atlas Mountains, and where the track ended, we put on our packs and continued on foot to the summit of Mount Tubkal, the highest point in North Africa. And then we headed home along a different route. We had achieved what we set out to do. We didn't buy any tickets and we shaped our own journey. And it was satisfying. But there was something missing. Very strangely, those journeys didn't feel quite 
as exhilarating as the journeys I'd been doing as a 10-year-old. That's odd, I thought. I know what. I need to make the journeys bigger, bolder, more ambitious, more adventurous, edgier. And so it was that in 2007, I climbed into the cockpit of a single-engine aircraft in Newfoundland and set off to fly solo across the North Atlantic. Coming in low over a glacier in Greenland, it felt like the tips of the wings would touch the rocks on either side at any moment. One small mistake, and I'd be dead. Shortly after that, I climbed into a small boat and headed across the Atlantic again, single-handedly. After seven years of planning, preparation, training, saving, and checklists, checklists of checklists, spreadsheets of checklists of checklists, after all of that, I had done what I set out to do, to fly solo and sail single-handedly across the Atlantic. And it was very satisfying. But still, there was something missing. Some of the wonder had gone from the journeys. I wasn't experiencing the fascination I had as a child. And now, I was a bit stuck. I really didn't know what to do. It was about this time that I went on a very different expedition. This time, I decided to try and cross a couple of miles of English countryside, only this time leaving all the kit at home. No screens or dials, no map, no compass, no GPS. I just used nature as my guide. And suddenly it was back, that feeling of wonder. And I would like to share with you the joys of natural navigation. It all starts with the senses. We have to start to notice the things that pass others by. What do you see when you look at this image? A tree, of course. You're in good company there. But did you notice that it's not symmetrical? There is more tree on the right-hand side. In northern parts of the world, the sun is due south in the middle of the day, every day of the year. And this is when it gives us most of its light and energy. And the plants reflect that. They grow bigger on their southern side. So when we look at this image, south is to the right of the picture, and we are looking east. The sun is shaping absolutely everything around us. If we stay with the trees for a moment and zoom in a bit, can you see the differences in this tree? Branches on the south side of the tree grow closer to horizontal as they reach for the light. On the north side of the tree, they grow closer to vertical. Zooming in further still, we find even the leaves are being sculpted by the sun. There are two main types of leaf on trees. There are sun leaves. They are smaller, lighter in color, and thicker, and much more common on the south side of trees. Shade leaves, bigger, thinner, and darker, much more common on the north side of trees. I like to think of this as the sun's footprints. And the sun is leaving footprints absolutely everywhere, all around us, on all our journeys, even in the heart of towns and cities. When we go to grab a coffee or a bite to eat, we might like to think we're shaping our own journey, but there's quite a good chance that we're actually following in the sun's footprints. Because in northern parts of the world, bars, cafes, and restaurants do much better on the sunny south-facing side of the street. I call this the street dining compass. So, we've tuned our senses, and we've started to find some compasses in nature. It is now time to make a map using nature. The wind leaves footprints everywhere, just like the sun does. And the animals know this. The spiders are no fools. They will spin their webs in places where the wind will not snatch it away straight away. So we find many more webs on the sheltered side of trees. So if we start to develop a relationship with the wind's footprints as well as the sun's, we're starting to get a richer picture. We're starting to sense both the sun and the wind's footprints, and it is starting to give us that more detailed picture of what's going on around us. We find more spider's webs on the lee side of trees. But what about these plants, which I'm sure you recognize? Stinging nettles. There's a great temptation to think stinging nettles are scattered randomly all around us. But 
Like all organisms, stinging nettles have to specialize. They have a niche. Stinging nettles like nutrient-rich soil. They like soil that has a lot of phosphates in it. The way human beings live, work, farm, and die changes the soil, making it richer in phosphates. So stinging nettles are actually a sign of human activity. They are indicating civilization. Now imagine that you are traveling across some wilderness looking for a village and you suddenly spot some stinging nettles. They are part of your map. They are telling you you are getting close to civilization. You're about to reach your village. And natural navigation takes on a whole other level of intrigue when we appreciate that the pieces fit together. Everything is connected. This beautiful toadstool, the fly agaric, is a very strong indicator that there are birch trees nearby. And birch trees don't grow in the heart of woodlands. They are colonizing trees, they grow at the edge. Now imagine that you're crossing some woodland. You're starting to worry. You're not sure exactly where you are. You're starting to worry about those cannibalistic witches. And then you spot this toadstool, and you think, where are the birch trees? And you spot them, and they guide you to the edge of the woods. It is at this moment that we start to appreciate that everything in nature is a clue and a sign to something. And this adds a level of beauty to what we see. Rainbows are beautiful, of course. But when we find meaning in them, that beauty really blossoms. Rainbows appear opposite the sun. So we can use them to navigate. Even when we can't see the sun, if the rainbow is opposite it, it is forming a compass for us. But it is also making a map of the air and the weather for us. Rainbows appear where the rain is. If you see a rainbow early in the morning, you're probably about to get rained on. Late in the day, the weather's probably about to improve. But they're doing much more than that because every single color in the rainbow is trying to tell you something about what's going on in the air. Lots of red in a rainbow means large raindrops, heavy rain. So when you look at this image here, on the left of this landscape, the rain is heavier than on the right. A question I get asked more than any other is this one. Is any of this really necessary? And that's the polite version. (laughs) In, In this age of smartphones, do we really need natural navigation? And I have two answers to that question. The first is no. If all you are trying to do is get through your day, if all you are ever trying to do is to get from A to B, then you don't need natural navigation. You don't need these skills. But what if we are trying to find fascination between A and B? Then my answer changes. Because consider, what do we find Interesting. What do we find fascinating? Art, literature, drama, music, dance, the arts and culture. The whole of the arts and culture could be deemed unnecessary if all we are trying to do is get through our day. But if we're trying to find fascination, they become essential. And so my answer to that question, is natural navigation necessary? is if you are trying to find interest in your journeys, if you are trying to find them fascinating, then it is absolutely vital. And once we accept this, everything changes. Things that were once happy to lurk in the background leap forward and begin to fizz in our mind. We notice some wildflowers, and they're growing all on their own. And then we think, why are they there? Ah, these wildflowers need more light than the plants around them. How are they getting that light? And it is this that makes us notice that there's a human path and there's an intersection with an animal track. And this opening up of the foliage lets the light in. And then we think about these beautiful flowers, these balsam flowers. Ah, they like damp ground. So there's probably a river or a stream nearby. So we tune our senses And we notice the birds in one direction sound different to the birds in another. That's where the river is. And then we remember 
that these flowers like alkaline soil. Ah, we're standing on limestone. And that tells us how the river will behave when the rain from the rainbow hits us. Rivers in limestone country rise very slowly. There are no flash floods. And if we're on limestone, there are probably caves nearby as well. And then we notice that the plants are aligned. They are all facing the same way to catch the southern light because it is this that attracts their pollinators, the insects. And then we appreciate that these flowers that had been in the background have mapped where the people are, what they're doing, what the animals are doing, where the river is, where the caves are, how the river will behave, and given us a compass, but so much more than all of that. They have given us a sense of connection. They have added meaning to our landscape, and they have made our journey fascinating. At the start of the talk, I promised you a strange question. And here it is, but it's not a question I'm going to ask you. It is a question I would like you to ask yourself. On your journeys over the coming days and weeks, I would like you to pause, to look around and ask yourself, which way am I looking? And then let nature, let your surroundings answer that question for you. And at that moment, you will have become a natural navigator. Thank you very much.